We're going to try to record this conversation. We are recording. We're now oh, officially recording. We're live. Yeah, it's true. Okay. Censor yourselves. Um, we're going to record this. We'll post the recording. So if you didn't write something down, you could run back and re-listen to it. And we're also, um, in the next couple of days, going to share with you a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet will have every project. We'll have information about the size of the team that will be appropriate for that project. It'll tell you who the mentor is. It'll identify some specific skills that you might get out of it or that you might have to have to get into it. Um, and some other information about that project. Some of these are like location specific, like you'll have to drive to so and so. So we'll try to put all that essentially in a big table that you'll be able to look at. Um, I think we should make it so that they can download their own copy. That would be so. Yeah, 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 yeah. And let me um, just just reiterate uh, term mentor, right? Just just so we're on the same page. In some cases, it's doctor. It's one of us, right? As your, as that's it. But in other cases, there's some additional person. That could be another ESRM faculty member, somebody outside. So when we say mentor, that's who we're talking about. You guys can always come to one of us. But the idea would be that would be the main content person you would, you would talk to first, right? Talk to him or her, um, et cetera. And then, and then for logistics, it's us. But that's what we mean by, by mentor. So in some cases, it's us. In some cases, it's other folks. But that would be your main point person when you're um, want to get more information about this project, or, or, or you know, want more details? That would be the person to to. Uh, you can talk to us, but that would be the first person to try to reach out to. Cool. There's lots, lots of projects. projects. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what questions do you have? Um, so we're just going to try to we put these in sort of general groups. And the first group is very small, but we have. Um, Two projects focused on monarchs, which many of you may have heard have been in the news of late because they are um, in serious decline. So we got some projects to help understand it. You want to talk about the first one? I can talk about the one. Yeah. Time. Okay. So basically, um, uh, we have been. So Ventura County has been doing a ton in terms of efforts to try to work on recovery of these critters. And so just to re remind you guys, there is a um, uh, migratory phase that's down in Mexico, near near Mexico City, up in the mountains, near Mexico City, and then there's, uh, and then those individuals come up all the way up and down the coast. Um, they need certain things to, to do that, including um, some of their host, different vegetation, including host plants like milkweed. We have many species of milkweed, but one thin-leafed species are very easy to cultivate, and our, our friends and colleagues around us here in the Santa Monica Mountains Fund have been distributing, have been growing Harvesting, growing, et cetera, propagating thousands, tens of thousands of milkweed plants, both for formal restorations, but also importantly for just random citizens of people's houses. Haven't really tracked that. So the idea of this project is let's go and start tracking that. Let's create a, a framework to from here on out make sure we know where these pot where these plants are going and maybe get a sense, hey, did, did they live? Or did somebody just take these plants and they planted them in Camarillo and they all died or something of that nature? So this is basically trying to keep track of what we've done so far and create a framework to continue to keep track of that on into the future. This is working with the, the Resource Conservation District? Uh, this is working with Santa... Uh, 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 most... Well, yeah, yeah, a little bit with resource, uh, Ventura County Resource Conservation District, but in particular with the Santa Monica Mountain Fund, which is a nonprofit entity pairs with the um, National Park Service. Yes. Yeah. Is this like a lot of original data collection, or is it more like already looking at data that Santa Monica already collected? They haven't really collected anything, so you, you guys would be collecting it. And so this could be surveys, this could be, um, you know, survey one, two, threes, this could be um, a whole variety of stuff. You guys would, would talk to them and figure out what works, what's going to work best. But it would include uh, new data um, amassing. Um, uh, who is this through again? Uh, this is, so the, the point people would be me and some folks from the Santa Monica Mountains Fund. So I'll, I'll, you'll see their names on the sheet. Yeah. Go ahead, please say your name. Uh, Darlene. Darlene. Is it specific to RMD and the nurse region? Or? Uh, it, 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 that, that's a key part of it, but it, it, it's broad, it could be broader than that. And so the other thing let me explain about these projects is some projects are really dialed in. And like the project is doing A, B, C, and D. So you will collect these data yep. in this way. Yep, and, and in some cases, we've been doing it for a long time. Like Dr. Ryman has a project where the students have created the template and started collecting some data, and now the folks this time are going to continue that on, et cetera. So we have projects like that. 
We have de novo projects, but yet nevertheless are super dialed in. And then we have projects like uh, this one we're talking about here, which is we have the outline of the project, but in the first couple of weeks, you're going to, you're going to be having conversations, chatting, what's possible, how are we going to make this work, et cetera. And, um, and so you guys will, will be able to evolve, shape, mold the project. And this is one of those. Um, so the second Monarch related project is essentially participating in um, the annual survey. So there's organizations that do an annual survey of the migration as it comes through this region. Um, we're working with the Los Angeles County Coordinator, who's in charge of all the Los Angeles County surveys. Um, and there's a, a set method and protocol they have for doing this. Um, we don't have the, the Ventura person on board, but we can certainly do the same protocol here. Yep. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to roast that person in. Otherwise, if you know, Trump, for example, someone that lives in Los Angeles County, this would be a good one for you also. So the idea here is to participate in the annual survey. It's a very standardized method, but we don't just want to know where they are. You'll be able to do some additional survey work on the side, right? Contextualize the presence of monarch butterflies based on maybe other habitat things that you're interested in. Presence of native versus the, the non-native milkweeds or other things like that, right? So it's still focused on monarchs, being a part of the count, contributing your data to the, the, the very active and real sort of official effort for tracking the monarch butterfly migration um, and making some neat contacts and uh, opportunities with those, those organizations. Um, and I'll say that the, the, the guy who's running it in LA um, He's, he's actually, he's officially, he's a, a grad student at, um, at Northridge, but he's a, a, this incredible naturalist. He's been like active in this area doing these things. He came, this is Richard Bachman, um, who came out and, he, and we got to meet on Rosa um, that very first week that Chris interviewed, for those of you that were on Rosa this summer. Um, anyway, he's a really, really interesting, fascinating guy. So those of you that are interested in just like being a naturalist in general and sort of getting involved in local things like that, it's going to be a super cool project. And that, that has a, a training uh, coming up, and then you guys would do the surveys in the fall. That's when the, when the looking at the roost sites. Monarchs. Um, we have a bunch of projects that sort of broadly fall into this coastal beach ocean sort of sustainability realm. Um, so just take these one at a time. Yeah. So oil rigs. So um, so we uh, are. If you guys heard the news this morning, we're just beginning to excavate sand today on one of our first decommissioned oil oil structures off the coast. This one up in uh, Goleta. We have 27 platforms off California's coast. Um, uh, some in state waters, some in federal waters, but many of them are in the process, either either beginning or soon will be in the decommissioning phase. So the question is. Can we use some of the, so the default thing is to cut, uh, ca cap the wells, seal them in, and then cut these giant superstructures, which literally are like the superstructure of a skyscraper. They're like a thousand feet tall. That's yeah, like a thousand huge. Feet of water. Cut the, cut the bottoms, cut the bottom of the steel off and then pull it out of the ocean. Um, that uh, to some of us seems to be a fool idea, given that that's a huge amount of embodied energy, et cetera. And there's something else we maybe be able to do with those platforms. One idea is perhaps some desalination. Um, and so this is, we, we had a, a, a group of students try this last, last year, first pass, do a first step. Obviously we're in the drought, things are getting more intense and water is becoming even more valuable. And so this is basically conceptual, mostly sort of literature review, that kind of you know, Excel spreadsheet estimating kind of thing. If we were to do this, how much would it cost? Would it pencil out? Um, that kind of stuff. Somebody had a hand up. Uh, I was thinking of like maybe kind of making an artificial reef or something like that. Um, but maybe not. Oh, oh, so, that's, so, so that, that's a great idea. That, that's one thing that we do do with um, decommissioned rigs. That's not what this project is. This project is can we leave it in place and, and, and still have all that structure and get some additional benefit given all the energy and, and stuff we put into it. But, but, but uh, great idea, but that's not this particular project. So for those of you that are interested in desal, which is going to be a significant component of California's water supply in the coming decades and century, otherwise we'll all have to move someplace else. Um, this would be a real, so that was, this is going to be a big, important growing field. Um, and so this would be a cool way to, 
to start getting your feet wet. Ooh, that was good. Feet salty. Uh, next one is uh, Huntington Beach. Uh, so um, getting ready to do some uh, surveys of businesses in particular in and around Huntington Beach where last, where almost like 10 months ago, um, the Huntington Beach oil spill happened. Lots of worry and fear. It was a relatively small spill we, we quickly figured out. Um, but nevertheless, we want to look at the impacts of that spill, possibly correlating that also to what happened in 2015 with the Refugio spill. So that's some straight ahead uh, a, a, a polling of businesses and, and looking at what the impacts were or were not on their businesses. But like very applied using qualitative methods. Yes. Sort of go like being sort of embedded in the community. Totally. Totally. Um, uh, it's from Huntington. This would be a cool way to... And start really quickly because we'd like to get the we'd like to have this time so that we have these surveys out, you know, just around the anniversary, so we can this wouldn't be going on for months and months and months. Seafood. Uh, and then sustainable seafood, which is just uh, those of you that are taking a coastal class, we have our large, massive data set, and uh, and this is working through that, looking at how sustainable our seafood supply is, looking at embodied energy, like how, where the carbon emissions associated with restaurant seafood versus versus market seafood, um, what's the diversity of options, did it change over COVID, those types of, so that, that's basically a large data base that you all would be mining, um, maybe collecting a little bit of data, but mostly processing uh, data, asking hypotheses. Is that all we have here? Oh, and then we have, uh, oh, good. So this is one um, that uh, I think, I think we're, you're gonna do, or I'm yeah, gonna, gonna do. Okay. do it. So, so, so this might be a group one, but this is something we're all interested in. But um, as we've been improving some of our coastal access points, some of those improvements include not just improvements in, in gates, etc., but also maybe some additional parking, etc., uh, maybe crosswalks, etc. So one of the questions is when we do that, when we improve coastal access, better signs, better better fencing, that kind of stuff. Do we see improved uh, physical uh, um, um, accident? Do we see fewer? car accidents and fewer bike collisions and things of that nature. So is it safer for pedestrians and vehicle travelers? Or maybe you get more accidents because now there's more people that maybe actually more. come. Or maybe more. So this is one where you have to, you're going to have to go call sheriff's organizations and, and, and local you know, county groups, et cetera, and try to compile. This, this data doesn't exist. So this is one we need to pull together. Um, and we've had several new places, for example, along the Malibu coast in recent years where we've improved that. So we have very specific points you can go and look and see – has the accident rate uh, improved, gotten better, stayed the same, et cetera. So that's that. Um, this is working out at Surfers Point where they are halfway through, uh, Surfers Point is in Ventura, um, halfway through um, a, a long but quite significant effort to implement a, a managed retreat to deal with shoreline erosion and rising sea levels. Um, and the idea is to uh, implement a, a pretty simple protocol to assess what's happening with wave resources in this stretch of coasts right now so that when the second phase of this project starts getting done, we'll have some baseline data in order to see what, if anything, changes. Um, so this is great for people that live locally in Ventura. You can get out to the beach to go for a walk as often as possible. Um, go ahead. Jack. Jake. Jake. Yeah, I don't, I don't, what's the, like, the, like, point of the surface point? Uh, project? Like, what's their, like, goal? What are they trying to do? Um, their their goal is to deal with the fact that, so right now, this is, um, this is an image of the, the phase two when it happens, and if anyone's been there lately, right now, pretty much this section of, of the beach does not have a nice promenade. It has, um, it has basically an asphalt stack that's crumbling into the ocean. Um, but at the top part of the point, there's healthy dunes. So the idea is to implement a, a there's a revegetated dune project in this middle part of the point to help deal with the erosion that's happening there. Oh. So it was taking out a hardened structure, putting in a, a much better, smarter option. Um, and when they do that second phase, the question is, what impact is that going to have on what's happening in the water? Um, BSA index. Okay, BSA. So um, some of you have, have helped with, with uh, helped us with this over the years. This is basically <clears throat> our our uh, multi factorial look at the conditions of our beaches, how healthy are our beaches. And, um, and when I uh, sort of pulled together some of our indices, I tried some things and, and, and ran some numbers, et cetera, and we got the index that we have, but we can use a lot more what ifs. So what if we did a multiplier effect? What if we did 
a uh, you know added in this other factor. So it's basically taking our, our existing data set that goes for many years, con conditions on beaches over many years, and um, and tries to combine things together in different ways. Do we get the same story if we if we add half the number of variables? If we use a multiplier, that type of stuff. So this is one for people that like to try different combinations of things. Um, not really any new data collection, but definitely new uh, data interpretation with this uh, project. Intention of developing a rapid assessment tool to help coastal managers understand the health and condition of a beach. So it's actually a pretty important contribution. Yep. Oh, it's super important. It's it's. I would go on to say it might be Nobel Prize winning, but I don't want to get you know ahead of myself. <laughs> a little bit. Um, so some campus projects you want to run through these. Yeah. Projects. So these are from uh, our our friends over at facilities. And so this, there's, there's several things here that we could use and need. One is a, a, a revamping of our plant palette for campus. We have an existing native plant palette, but in the era of reduced watering, et cetera, um, we might need to adjust that somewhat. Um, a next, second project is looking at how aware of sustainability issues are our population, is our population on campus, both students and faculty and staff and everybody kind of thing. And so this is this would basically be doing a survey to people understand what the conditions are. Uh, the Z campus zero waste plan is to uh, we have an we have an existing plan, but it's not really very robust. But but essentially redoing the the campus approach to our waste stream and seeing if we can more fully reduce the amount of stuff that's going into those trash cans with the goal of ideally having no um, uh, stuff go to a landfill. Um, and then we have a green revolving fund. So one of the things that, um, uh, like places where Dan and I have been, one of the reasons, they're so, one of the ways they're so successful is they have a lot of money and they put that into like a zero interest loan. And so if we want to replace our light bulbs here, we just get money from that loan, buy the new, buy, buy the LEDs or whatever, even though they cost more. And then in the cost savings over several months, we pay the, the loan back. We don't have such a fund here at Channel Islands. That's a smart idea. We, we, we don't have such a fund here at Channel Islands. And so the idea is, um, how would we structure that? What's a way to make it work? How, how, do we, how do we get money into it in the first place? And then what would be the rules? Would we allow student groups to do it? Would we allow facilities to do it? So this is more for folks interested in the, the finance side of sustainability. Um, so for all of these, you'd be working closely with the sustainability office on campus. It'd be really, and they have... Roxanne, they, right. Yeah, and, and she employs lots of students, past and present. Um, so it's a cool way to sort of get in with what's actually happening on campus. Totally, totally. Uh, sustainable dining. I'm not. I don't know the exact specifics, but I think this is built around not just food options, but also what are we doing in terms of the the plate provisioning and 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 that kind of stuff as well. Specifically in campus stuff. dining. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, and then uh, decarbonization roadmap. We we. Um, don't have a very clear plan, just, even though the fact that I'm on the committee and we have meetings about this, it just doesn't seem to go a lot of places. Um, so this would be um, helping us again strategize. So this wouldn't be um, implementing a decarbonization plan. This would be, given where we are right now, given, given this current situation, how can we go forward with our organization? Again, another really useful skill if this is the kind of uh, discipline or kind of area you guys might want to go into uh, post-graduation. Um, let's get through like two or three more of these and then we'll take a little break. We'll take sort of questions so far just in general. And oh, yeah, we'll, questions we'll so far? a little break. Okay, cool. Um, so we have a bunch of or just sort of like more biodiversity oriented projects. Um, we run an annual bio blitz, which is sort of a community event that involves going out and collecting a lot of data using specific digital tools to identify what species are where and when. Um, so we do this sort of as a campus-wide community event, um, but between now and then, students in this project will also essentially be collecting as much data on their own as they can. It's going to go into a larger data set about this. So they're going to ask questions about what is where, when is it blooming, when is it present, when it is not pleasant, present. <laughs> pleasant. What is it not pleasant? Some plants are not pleasant. <laughs> um, and so this is, this is part biodiversity science, part sort of doing this community event um, in the in the early spring. Uh, okay, this is mine. This is uh, doing a project that we've, we sort of took a couple stabs at for a few years, but hasn't really matured. But basically, this is looking at the distribution of sand dollars 
which are also a key part of our Sandy Beach ecosystem, the underwater part of our Sandy Beach ecosystem. Uh, just look at their distri abundance distribution um, and if that has changed over time and then with a similar uh, or species that's often associated with them in the sand, uh, Ranella or sea pens, these are little invertebrates that are that are in shallow water sandy areas. And this would involve um, both surveying, so broad surveys of dive shops and things of that nature. Um, hey, do you what, do you know where there are there uh, sand dollars off this particular beach or the sand dollars off that particular beach type of thing? As well as going to museums and looking at historic collections and historic distributions of these organisms to see if they've changed uh, over time. So that's more of a natural you history project. What's that? Snorkeling. Uh, you could you could totally do snorkeling. Yeah, I mean, we also have a research dive program here, but that that might be that's probably too tall an ass for you guys. A burn banning station. This is uh, Brenton. Uh, Professor Spees is a uh, doc. Excuse me, doctor. Doctor Spees Dr. now uh, uh, is uh, wanting to um, create more purposeful uh, annual surveys of bird populations in and around Cam Park. I think that's on here too. There's something else on bird banning. I don't know what that other one was. You don't go together. Oh wait. I didn't know. I think he was banning. Is it separate? Uh, oh wait, this, this is, oh is this the individual project? I have no idea. Oh, this is the individual project. Oh. So we'll skip that one. Never mind. Yeah, sorry team. I ignore that one. Okay, now we are. Yeah, so number seventeen isn't isn't for you guys. We have we have sorry. two capable students already yeah. on that one. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> you guys can tell us about your project. Anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, so so what I was just describing are the Camarillo Park bird surveys, and so again with that, um, this is where uh, you'd work with. Uh, Dr. Spees to go and do it's also the frequent the survey. The, the Nest Museum thing at Camarillo. Oh, yeah. Well, Western Museum. Yes. Uh, well, Western Foundation for Vertebrate Zoology. Thank, Thank you. you. And so, um, yeah. So this is basically, so this, this is for people that like birds or want to learn their birds and, uh, you know, go out to campus and do a lot of surveying and let's see what, what critters we have here that fly. Uh, barn owl diet, that's another project we've done on and off for many, many years, looking at our, bar we have resident barn owl populations here on campus. Barn owls are cool because they do not have a crop. A lot of birds have a crop or they swallow some stones, so they sort of muscularly chew. Uh, owls do not have that, so when they, they eat their prey, after a little bit, they cough, they cough it up, right? So they cough up a... Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's it's a beautiful thing of fur and bones and uh, hard structures, as it were. And so they cough these up right near their, essentially near the same place every day. So we'll go to some of these stations around campus weekly, uh, uh, pick up the old ones. The first week we'll just pick up the old ones, and then after that we get the new ones, and we know those were were coughed up in the last couple days. And then you guys will dissect those, and we look at the prey. Has that prey changed over time? With the drought, are we seeing these critters eat different food items than they were eating, say, 10 years ago? That kind of stuff. So that's basically a little bit of walk around, but a lot of lab time in terms of um, a dissecting and things of that nature. So it's really kind of a cool sort of like forensic puzzle to be like, oh, this is the is this mandible of shrew or a bull? And yeah, if you like Dan Brown novels or things like that, or, or Sherlock Holmes, you'll love it. It's good. That's good. Um, so we have some Santa Rosa Island related projects. Um, we have a project working on Black Mountain to do a demographic study of the, the island oaks on top of the mountain. For, for those of you that are eager to do like incredibly intense field work in an extraordinarily beautiful, special place, this is for you. I, I don't know. For those of you that have spent a lot of time up there, do you have anything you want to maybe just a, a mention? Is it worth going up there? It's a place that you would that like no one else goes and tromps around. Or, like right. views it's basically it's like I'm getting all excited now, but it's <laughs> it's like pretty much right up here and sort of get to look down across all this really spectacular. And the work has happened to teach him to the member of Nest Year, really important figure, a very sweet woman. Amazing um, restoration he, scientist. So he is um, so for those of you interested in field work, this is awesome. Yes, go ahead, please say your name. Uh Kat. Kat. And how many or like approximately how many field days do you think this would be? Like is it like once a month? As many as possible. <laughs> many many, many. Well, that's, that's, uh, 
It'll probably be like maybe three or four trips for something like this. I don't think we have an exact count. It's going to depend on productivity in the field. With the trip um, being a long weekend or yeah. slash week kind of thing. And I'll, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to say your name again. It's Brooke. Brooke, okay, um, thank you. Are like all the trips to the island You have to bring your own food. Everything else is covered. But you get to stay at the station. Um, yeah, so you bring your own food, but everything else would be covered for you. Depending if you get to go out on the park boat, which is kind of cool, makes you feel cool. <laughs> um, we have a project working with the National Marine Sanctuary and with Island Packers. Um, all the ships in the sanctuary have been collecting balloons, like mylar and this sort of like latex balloons that are like floating around in the ocean. And they've been like collecting this. They have like bags full of balloons. Um, one among you has already helped to sort of go through this stack of balloons and start like digitizing them. But the idea is to both create an actual data set and look at some like frequency analysis of, you know, do you see more certain kind of balloons, say in like February or yeah. like after graduation season, right? Like when do you start seeing these things? Easter, um, who knows? And and could we develop some sort of me messaging and education in our communities to help people realize that balloons are a pretty stupid thing. Balloons suck. <clears throat> no, balloons, balloons blow. blow. That's, that's very clever. I see what you did there. Um, so this is working with existing data, working with these groups to collect more data, developing some connections with NOAA, the National Marine Sanctuary Office, um, and with um, Island Packers. Um, to really cool partners. Um, this number 22 is sort of like, it's a, it's a little bit of a departure from the typical capstone format, um, but for those of you that have visited the island, um, maybe for a day or a weekend, there are a few kind of typical activities that groups do when they get out to send the research station on Santa Rosa. And the idea here is to develop some new activities. Um, and we've got some really clear ideas. We ran a bunch of trips last year sort of trying some different things out. So if you're interested in sort of getting out there, thinking about history, cultural resource management, First Nations considerations, present ecology, all those things, and sort of connecting them with, say, K-12 education, because you want to get into maybe outdoor education or environmental education, um, this would be a really cool opportunity. Um, this is one other one right around the station in um, December 20, I guess it was 20, shit, 20 or 21. Damn, the COVID time warp. Um, the park opened up a new trail um, on Rosa. And it kind of runs right here. Um, and so it's a new trail. So new trails mean all sorts of interesting things. And over the summer, we established sort of a baseline monitoring system. But the idea is to get out there and revisit this trail to keep track of who's using it and how much and what impact that's having on the surrounding resources. So this is sort of an opportunity to do some sort of ecological and also human impact mapping and monitoring. Um, the park is interested in this. Um, I can't say much more about this one, but this will be working with Dr. Steele, who's got uh, you want to say about it? Yeah, so uh, so we've been collecting sand for ever on all our different beach projects, et cetera, and um, we haven't always analyzed them. Uh, uh, we, have, we haven't had time to analyze them. And so this is one that is going to be looking at um, what the sand grain size is uh, so that we can then, or so that you and Dr. Steele can then uh, look and see if that explains any of the other things about marine debris and other other aspects about the system, like microplastics that. and stuff, right? But cool, just sort of geomorphic. Yes, um, definitely yeah. something that's into soils and, and earth earth systems kind of stuff. So they wouldn't collect the sand grain? Uh, like yeah, you should talk to Dr. Steele. I believe there's no, or, or if there is collection, it'd be very minimal. I think it's mostly just going through Sandy existing exists, samples. Yeah. yeah. Um, but speaking of small things <laughs> in the sand, small things. Um, Got a lot of a number of microplastic projects. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so microplastic projects. So um, this is uh, one that is just just relatively new came to us. So these are some colleagues from um, uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo are starting to use our our FTIR machine, and their research is looking at plastics produced and and sh and being shed from agricultural lands. 
Um, oh, like the sheets that they put out. Exactly, on exactly. So hoop houses or with strawberries, we put plastic directly on the ground and then fumigate them. So this is looking at um, how you know, just the amount of plastics coming off. About five years ago, we had a student group that did look at plastics and soils relative to roads. Um, but this is a much more uh, sort of robust um, uh, thing. So that's that project. Uh, using the methods that those folks have developed. Um, and then, uh, and also uh, uh, Professor Kafala, she also does some of that. So that would also be maybe uh, um, partnering with her a bit too. Uh, brewery microplastics, this is sort of an ongoing project where we've worked with different uh, local breweries, et cetera, um, uh, and looked at, look at a load of, of microplastics in beer based upon that last stuff last year. I think um, this year would be, we could do microbrewery, but really more interested in looking at um, beer broadly writ. So what is in the store, right? And, and what, what is the, what is the exposure people are getting by drinking beer brand one, beer brand two, beer brand three, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, this is a, a, a general looking at, at beach, uh, beach contaminants. And this is, wait, I have a question. I'm just oh, curious. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, just to be sort of equal opportunity with the beverages. Um, is it just beer? I mean, could we also be looking at like Spiked bubbly water, which is a thing no, now, or sure, yeah. you guys. Beer. Oh, because I like beer. Um, beer. But so, so, uh, but basically, it started as in conversations with a bunch of local microbrewers who were like interested in this question. But yeah, but 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 so the reality is, we could do whatever, and we have had students do water and stuff like that, which is which is also an interesting question. We started with the brewing process, beca brewery, because we could look at where in the brew stage the like, plastics were entering. Go to the brewery. Um, but, like, but, but that's not to say you have to quote unquote do beer, but, but that's just the thing that we've been working on. But, but the idea would be, the idea would, so we have now, we're part of a team that has just created the new standards for the state of California for drinking water in terms of what micro, you know, how we measure microplastics. And so while we, do, you can work on any kind of thing about microplastics, the liquid stuff is of particular interest yeah. and relatively easy to do for you guys. Um, so that that was that was the comment. Sorry, and we got all excited. We plowed ahead. Um, we can. How's everybody doing? We have roughly ten more to get through, and then we can stop. And people that want to ask questions, and we can otherwise end early. We could take another break here. How's everybody doing? What's like the pulse of the room? Great. Plow I'm getting plow through. Plow through. Plow through. Plow plow through. Plow through. Like no. If there's anyone that's like that, you can just duck out. That's totally cool. Okay. So uh, this one is looking at uh, macroscopic and micro. Scopic plastics on beaches in particular. This is going to be uh, uh, Yeah, this is with uh, paired with our friends at heal the bay Which is the environmental group that runs all the beach cleanups in Los Angeles County. We can Oh man, is this computer his phone is silent. Sorry, uh, that was that's uh, that's my collaborator from uh, from Turkey um, anyway, so so um, beach uh, Macro and heal the microplastics bay. and heal the bay. So this is um a great one because our beach cleanup is coming up in a few weeks, right? Go to cleanup day. So it's not something seventeenth. Not something that we're going to do in January one, to, right? So, so we're going to um, have these groups that are collecting plastic. They're going to give us some of their plastic, right? And we're going to figure out what it is. In particular, they're really interested in the recycling symbol number seven. Is this sort of smorgasbord of of stuff that people don't know what they are? So we're going to collect all those and fingerprint them and and understand what they are. In addition to fingerprinting other plastics on the beach and looking at microplastics geographically from a, a, you know a, a broad geographic range, that's so cool. um, that's that project. Um, and then this one is uh, this this one here, plastic footwear. Um, uh, the main person you I mean work with me, but but also uh, Zach Atkins. So he's he's going to be our our uh, lead mentor on this project. And this is one where we want to look at the composition of common plastic things. Forks, straws, uh, plates, things of that nature, um, around the county, around the counties around us. Look to see if there's any similar patterns, and look to see what the demographic correlates are. So, um, in community of income X, do, are, are there straws all made of the same kind of material? In 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 you know community Y, are, are, is, it, is it much more diverse? That kind of stuff. So, understanding what the the sort of plastic sourcing is like. Um, is it plastic specific or is it like single use? Uh, well, it could, it, could be, it could be either. It could be either. It could be either. I, I was thinking it would mostly be plastic to try to get a footprint or get a, 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 a handle on the sources of the microplastics, but it could be, it could be whatever. I mean, our, our instrument will be able to tell you 
if it's you know made out of cornstarch or or those other types of or bamboo or something of that nature. Um, okay, uh, sea urchin microplastics. This is this is a, a new one that we just came on the, the scene on Friday from some conversations. This is uh, with me, but especially with Professor Spees. And this one is for people that live in LA or don't mind going to LA. So this is using the lab facilities at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, um, and they have a fantastic. They have a fantastic culturing facility. In fact, when I first moved to LA, it wasn't a job, but the place I first volunteered was as a, as a, a, a rearer of jellyfish at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium years and years ago. Um, <laughs> and so uh, what this is, so sea urchins are really cool. Sea urchins, and you guys might have done this in your bio labs, very, very easy to spawn, very easy to get them to release eggs and sperm. And you can fertilize them. And instantly when they fertilize, they form, form a fertilization ring. So in about... 10 seconds, you can see if they actually successfully fertilize or not. Um, and so very easy to do. But then also it's easy to take these, these embryos, put them in some uh, in a, an aquaria and grow them up to days 5, 10, 14 and look at their development. So the idea here is we're going to expose these different um, uh, juvenile, you know, little, little tiny developing embryonic uh, larvae of sea urchins to different concentrations of microplastics and see if that impacts how they develop. So, so do they not fertilize as much, or once, they, or, or once they've been fertilized, do they develop slower? Do they develop with deformities? That type of stuff. So if you're interested in toxicology and... and, 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 and really cool structured experimental... And, and we have done this kind of experiment here before in the past, but we need to set up the whole lab. They have everything all, all turnkey down there. So it's super, super simple to use their facilities. And... They have all the rotifers and things to feed the baby urchins, so it would be super, super simple. The only thing is, it's it's in LA, obviously, so you need to have transportation. And, and this wouldn't be going every day for nine months, but this would be going for you know uh, quite often over the course of many weeks, month or month or two, to do the main work. Because you're gonna fall deeply in love with all these yeah microscopic totally um, ecological monitoring projects, Canoe Creek. Uh, this is another one that we've been doing for, for some time. This is specifically looking at the efficacy of different land use. And uh, this is so um, Conejo Creek, which starts up sort of behind us and then spirals all the way down around us, goes, flows down the basically the 101 of the Conejo grade, goes, hits the main stem Conejo Creek, and, uh, or Cayugas Creek, excuse me, and then flows down to Magoo. So this is a, we have a, about four different monitoring points, but the cool thing is, the most interesting one is, we have one chunk that's in a 70s development that's an old box culvert. So the water is going through concrete with basically nothing on the sides. And then a relatively new development from about 20 years ago where the riparian corridor was left intact. So the idea is we go in there and measure what's the water quality like there, what's the water temperature like, what are the microplastics like, et cetera, using our water quality probes. And, and you can see the effect of having an intact um, riparian uh, corridor versus having a devastated, urbanized, concretized thing. And the reason why that's cool is normally when people do these studies, it's like, there's this, there's, there's this thing over here, and then five, ten miles over there, it's over there. This, these are about a quarter mile apart, so they're, they're paired. So the same weather, the same rain, the same uh, d basic demographics of the residents, so it's pretty cool. So that's one that um, you guys should have ideally have taken, um, coastal contaminants. Uh, and if not, be familiar with using our water quality probes. It's not high tech, but it, but it, it's it's using probes all the time. Yeah, question. Yeah, is that like pretty consistent water? Like OG for like data collection? And stuff? Uh, once a week. Once we do it once a week, and then and then uh, whenever we do get our first big rain, yeah, we'd want to go out right before that rain, yeah. and then right after. So so mostly it's pretty consistent, except for around that you know who knows when that's going to be. Is that like once a week in the fall. Yes. Like yes. Now, yes. 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 Uh, okay, so this one is, uh, this is a super cool one also. This is a brand, brand new one. So this is um, looking at the impacts of the drought restrictions. So I'm not where everybody lives, but for folks that are in like San Fernando Valley, uh, East County Ventura, so Camarillo, uh, Thousand Oaks, et cetera, we all as of June 1 have now been forced to only one day a week water our, our lawns, outdoor watering. And it's now very clearly showing up. So now we have a high proportion of people whose lawns are dying. So this is basically going to be using some satellite data to confirm that and then drive around, or, or sorry, use satellite data to look at people's dead lawns and then drive around and do visual surveys to confirm that. So to confirm that what we're seeing is really happening. 
and the idea there is to look at how well did these drought restrictions, uh, you know, how, how well did this play out? And we can overlay some demographic things. So was it the wealthy neighborhoods that has the highest compliance? Was it the wealthy neighborhoods that have the lowest compliance, et cetera? And this will be really, 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 really helpful because this drought isn't going away. So while our jurisdictions have experienced this, this watering restriction, it's coming to everybody else. So really helpful thing for, for um, dealing with future uh, for the next phase of the drought. So that's, again, GIS and then driving around and doing some, some in-person observations. Not walking on people's properties, but just sort of, you know, from the car looking. <laughs> um, oh, this is another cool one. Uh, actually, the guy just texted me this morning. He's like, hey, does everybody do this? So this is working with a, a, an activist in the community who is a um, fantastic photographer. And there's a, if you guys drive on the 101 towards L.A., you'll go up the freeway and then you kind of drop down. You're going... There's a large field to the right after you've gone maybe about two or three miles past the peak of the Conejo grade. Um, that is a historic wetland. Um, it's in, there's a controversy around it. So the, a person has purchased the land and wants to develop it and says, all we have to do is take a big giant cistern, bury it under water, bury it in the ground, and that'll take care of all the water and it'll be great. And so... Um, so this is an, a, a project that this uh, gentleman has started to accumulate historic photographs, maps, old accounts from the 40s, 50s, 30s, 60s, 70s, and to show what the, ma what the functioning of this wetland was like. So this is a historical reconstruction, historical ecology project to, um, to uh, well, I, I shouldn't say prove because you would be looking at that, but the hypothesis is that this has been a healthy wetland. It's been a healthy wetland for a long time. Let's let's see if we have evidence of this ecosystem for decades in the past, as it appears we do. So we has a lot of this stuff starting. So this is basically pulling this stuff together. Uh, is it in this state, or is it just certain other states where wetland destruction is illegal? It's federal in this federal. country. In this country. So I'm a little confused. There's some interesting your recent Supreme Court cases about what. So okay. so so yes. So uh, people getting bendy with that. Trying to do terrible things to wetlands on their private properties? Yes. Okay. Okay. Short answer. Yes. Jake. So he's doing it to try and stop what's going to happen to it? Like he doesn't want it to get developed. He's trying to show that it's up like. Well, yeah. So, 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 the, so this is. So I'm not telling people how to advocate for something one way or the other, but this is saying what was the, what was the state of this ecosystem over the last many decades? Do we have evidence that it was a healthy, functioning wetland? And not just like, yeah, I think so, but actually it's pulled together with maps, with imagery, with, with personal accounts. So it's actually it's a historical ecology project, which, has, which would have direct impact <laughs> on the policy and everything. But it's not, it's, this project in itself isn't, isn't like an advocacy thing or... Do you know what I'm saying? For those yeah. interested in the policy, like, there would be like a lot of field work in this one too? Uh, a little bit of field work, a lot of, a lot of looking through archives, a lot of pulling stuff together and trying to figure out timelines, that kind of stuff. More, more like kind of library uh, uh, type of field stuff. Like the yeah. one of the local library or the like, city planning office. Right. Like where they'll have like historic survey maps. Of right. And the wetland, we just, the, the name has kind of gone back and forth, but people typically now just refer to it as the Borchard Wetland when they talk about it, which is the name of the road next to it. Uh, uh, okay, out of kind. Oh, this is my project. Uh, so this is um, this is a project where I need uh, students. So we are. This is a, this is a long term project to go a couple years, but this is um, literature review basically and synthesis. So reading a bunch of papers, um, figuring out. Um, we're, we're helping the state create a new approach to restoration to restoring things in the coastal zone. Uh, could be a wetland, could be a, a kelp, kelp uh, reef, could be a sandy beach, whatever. And so this is going through a bunch of literature and figuring out um, what are the best predictors of wetland of excuse me, not wetland, of, of a restoration success and uh, how do people measure it? So it's creating a big giant database from the, the known literature, both the peer reviewed literature as well as the gray literature and government publications kind of stuff. So that's that. Uh, and then this is um, an another continuation of a project we've been doing for several years. In this case, we have six uh, air quality monitoring stations, one of which is on the roof of this building, um, where we're looking at uh, uh, ozone, particulate matter, et cetera, around Ventura County. 
and, um, and, and turning that data into publicly available data sets. And in particular, this is going to be going through the data sets and starting to mine them and starting to look for interesting patterns. Hey, in this neighborhood, we have a lot of particulate matter problems. In this neighborhood, not so much. Both using our, our sensors that we've in installed as well as um, other publicly accessible data like Purple Air's uh, PM 2.5. So this is for somebody that that that's inter that likes Excel spreadsheets, likes to play around, likes to look for patterns, that kind of stuff. So We're also working with like a really active and important local NGO, which is CFRI, which is yes, citizens are responsible. Uh, so so uh, no, now it's yeah. now it's climate first. Oh yeah, they manage responsible. Oh my gosh, I think I can't remember the rest of it. Um, so 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 both this and Borchard have direct. You know, the projects would have direct implications, as many of our projects would have direct implications for maybe management or policy or some such thing. But but this is not do, advocating. It's just like, let, let's look and see what the data tells. What do the patterns show us? Uh, and then there's, there's, a, there's then this is working with uh, Joey um, and the folks at the National Park Service. Um, it, this There's several ideas here, but basically some of these involve uh, different um, uh, experimental manipulations of of plants, et cetera. In some cases, it's watering them more. And, and the idea is how do we get these, these restored plants? How do we get these, these plants that we're trying to be more abundant in and around the Santa Monica's to be more successful? And so, uh, that, so th this is uh, mostly field, mostly in the field. Uh, cool stuff. restoration. Have you seen that, uh, like the oak restorations you've done and seeing like which <coughs> Uh, I, I'm sure they'd be open to it. I don't remember if he specifically mentioned oak. He might have, but um, but yeah, this is one of those ones where he's like, we just need a bunch of help on these projects. So this would be one where if you guys were interested, you you talk to you talk to Joey, talk to the folks at Santa Monica, and say, hey, so what do you guys need? Like, well, there's like X, Y, and Z, and you could say, hey, what about the oaks? And they would either say, oh, we got that under control, or actually that would be fantastic. So and there's that, another one where this is like really an amazing opportunity for you as a student to get involved in one of our local national park units lots of former esrm folks are employed by the park service and many of them so go through this santa monica mountains um, unit conduit totally super cool totally uh oh this is one uh it's actually become even more interesting as of with the uh air oh, two yeah. ruling last week but this is there's already some efforts along this route but this is um, again, a bit more amorphous, but this is how do we boost the electric infrastructure, right? So charging infrastructure, charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. So that could be on campus, that could be in our local neighborhoods, that could be more regionally. It's it's uh, it's it's up to you. There's already an effort to do a crowdsourcing um, effort of from Monterey down to us, but I think we need some more hyper local stuff for us here for campus for for all you 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 students for all the staff for all different folks. So that one is um, mostly a GIS-based um, project, and oh, this is this is Jesse. Yeah, that's um, Jesse's so project. This this one maybe needed to be somewhere else on the list, but um, this is working with a colleague. In, so this is for folks who live in or near Santa Barbara. Um, and this is working with some local birding groups that have a lot of bird data um, in and around the Goleta Slough, and they're interested in doing some habitat characterization work associated with the bird data. So the bird data exists, you don't have to be a birder, but if you're interested in sort of getting out in the fields of the wetlands and doing some just sort of good whole, good old fashioned sort of ecological assessment of like what is the biodiversity, what is the habitat structure in this area, the bird groups there are really interested in, in putting those two pieces together. And I think, uh, and then, and then and the independent independent project. Project. Yep. that's it, okay.